Broadcasting from New York City to the world, it's the G-Man Interviews. Welcome. The following is an excerpt from a 2001 PBS.org article entitled The History of Saint Brother, written by Sarah Ann Shaw. Same Brother made its debut January 15, 1968. Ray Richardson, one of the show's first producers, was a brilliant young man in his early 20s. He never wavered in his commitment to portraying all facets and accomplishments of black life. Same Brother grappled with issues of housing, employment, and education, showcased local and national performers from all segments of the arts, provided a platform for political discussions, and much more, all from a black perspective. This is what Ray Richardson said in 1969 on the show's first anniversary. We attempted to create an outlet for many of the viewpoints that exist in our community and to deal with political, educational, and cultural activities relevant to black people. We have had successes, occasional failures, and many memorable incidents. Joining me to discuss the circumstances that led to the creation of the groundbreaking series and the mysterious death of its maverick host, is renowned scholar and activist Dr. Jeffrey B. Perry. Dr. Perry was educated at Princeton, Harvard, Rutgers, and Columbia University, and has been involved in domestic and international social justice issues for more than 30 years. Dr. Perry preserved and inventoried the Hubert H. Harrison papers and helped to place them at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia University. Harrison was a West Indian American political activist and educator who came to be known as the father of Harlem radicalism. Dr. Perry was also responsible for developing the Hubert H. Harrison Papers, 1883 to 1927, Finding Aid. Perry was influenced toward serious study of matters of race and class in America through personal experiences, articles, and the work of independent scholar and close personal friend, the late Theodore William Allen, author of The Invention of the White Race. Dr. Perry appeared on the show several months ago to discuss Allen's landmark publications, and the life of Hubert H. Harris. Welcome back, Dr. Perry. Good morning, Gary, and thank you so much. I'd like to begin by asking you, I guess the most obvious question, who was Ray Richardson? Ray Richardson was a young TV producer in Boston, on Boston Public Television, WGBH, from 1968 to 70, who was a real trailblazer and did wonderful and very progressive political programming for the black community. He worked with some other very talented people, Henry Hampton, Sarah Ann Shaw, Stan Lathan, and a host of others, and all very young at the time, and uh, were putting out a primetime show in Boston called Say Brother. The show had such impact that the powers that be at a certain point decided to cut the show off, to take it off the air, and to fire Ray Richardson. Now, Ray Richardson's born in 1946, and his mother is Ada Harrison Richardson, whom I met in the course of my work on Mrs. Richardson's father, Hubert Harrison. Hubert Harrison is known as the father of Harlem radicalism. J.A. Rogers in World's Great Men of Color describes him as the foremost Afro-American intellect of his era. A. Philip Randolph refers to him as the father of Harlem radicalism in a period when Harlem was considered the center of radical black thought and the international Negro Mecca. Harrison, Hubert Harrison, lives from 1883 to 1927, and he is the major radical influence on A. Philip Randolph and on Marcus Garvey. So when I grew up, that's like Malcolm and Martin. He's a giant in black history. He's the founder of the militant New Negro movement years before Alain Locke. And he's a tremendous literary talent and orator. So he's a giant of black history. And that's Ray's grandfather. On his father's side, his father was also extraordinary. Virgil Richardson was one of the founders of the American Negro Theater and the also a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, but when his father returned from World War II, he had a couple of confrontations and incidents with white supremacist um, officials and, and, and just people and decided he was not going to 
deal with it anymore in the U.S. and decided to move to Mexico. So when Ray, uh, later on, Ray goes down to visit his father in Mexico, he grows up with his brother Charles Richardson, who co-authored an article with me on Ray. And they grow up in Harlem and New York City environs. And he attends Horace Mann School and then goes to Boston University, where he's majoring in film. And he finishes his undergraduate work and is in their cooperative program, uh, working towards a master's when Martin Luther King Jr. is killed on April 4th, 1968. And then all of a sudden, some of the TV stations and public broadcasting start swinging into action, saying, gee, we have to pay more attention to the African-American community. you got, you got to get some more people involved in productions and the like. So that's, in brief, how he comes to work for WGBH. Which would you say had the greatest impact on Richardson's decision to become an outspoken critic of racism and racist policies? Having Hubert H. Harrison as a grandfather or having to live and survive in a racist environment? I, I think they both actually had some impact. And I say that, uh, you know, with some deep understanding, I think, of how, how this white supremacist environment is so total and so all-encompassing and how one would be radicalized by that. But also... Um, although I didn't know Hubert Harrison, I've been, I spent 30 years researching him and been through his papers many times and his diary and I feel like I've had many conversations with him. And I knew his daughter, who's Ray's mom, and she was an extraordinary woman. She became a principal in New York City in the 1960s, an extraordinary achievement. And she also comes out of that theater movement with, with her husband. And, uh, she did quite a job bringing up her two sons. And she was pretty strict and firm in, in a very good way because when you read the accounts of Ray, you read about how he's polite with people. He works well in groups, very bright, but really always kind of trying to bring out the best in those he's working with also. Uh, some outstanding qualities. And I, I think he gets this from his grandfather, he gets it part from his mother, part from his father. And then he's always having everything consciously process through what he has to deal with in this society and for him as a tv producer one of the uh, really appealing things i think and outstanding things is how he tried to really make the medium of tv serve the black community you know be both a voice for expression and uh, a vehicle for understanding not only what goes on in the black community but the forces that are affecting it so i, I think he you know it was a, extraordinary Shortly after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a James Brown concert was broadcast in an effort to keep people off the streets and quell the rage and racial tension that was spreading through Boston and its black communities. The concert played a significant role in the creation of Save Brother. Can you explain the pivotal link between the concert and show? Uh, yes. So King is, is assassinated on the 4th, and on the 5th, James Brown was scheduled to do a concert at the Boston Garden in downtown Boston. And city officials were very worried that given the sentiment in the country and, and how there were eruptions throughout the country, uh, that something might happen in Boston that they wouldn't be able to control. So they looked for some alternative. And what they found was uh, a willingness from some progressive people at the public broadcasting network in Boston, WGBH, to air the show and then to get word out, particularly to the African-American community, that they would be able to see it on TV and they wouldn't have to travel you know, conditions were not certain what the conditions would be like on the 5th. So many, many people stayed home. It was a great sacrifice for James Brown. This is how he and his group make a living, right? Uh, and there was some remuneration, but I don't think he, you know, I don't think he got near what he would have gotten if he had the concert. So it was a very positive thing on Brown's behalf, too. So then they had the concert, and uh, uh, that was the start in some ways for a commitment from a WGBH to do some black programming and it was after that that they started hiring some black staff because the numbers even after a year or two of say brother the show that ray richardson developed i mean you would have uh, a thousand hours of airtime and maybe an hour and a half or two you know for the black community so i mean it was very disproportionate in boston and nationwide nationwide the numbers were even more far more striking 10 11 000 to 1 nationwide at that time once Save Brother hit the WGBH airwaves, Richardson quickly became a hero to many in the black community because of his directness, fearlessness, and incessant need to present the raw truth about black life in Boston, 
America and abroad. How did the majority of whites in Boston, from regular citizens to elected officials, react to Richardson and the show? Well, uh, first off, on the black community, I just want to point out one third of the black community was watching that, that show, you know, uh, while Richardson's producing. That's a staggering number, anybody who's worked in media. One third of the potential audience. And what I've, I've seen, there was a one study done by a, a media group, and they said that s s still, with all that black viewership, uh, one half the audience was white. So at least for a segment of the European American community, there was interest and maybe a bit of learning because the shows were, were fascinating. They, the shows include variety. They had politics. They had entertainment. They had discussions. They had, it was just a combination, wonderful entertainment, the arts, just a fascinating show. I mean, it broke many into many new areas, uh, particularly for black programming, I think, in black TV. So he had some response. I mean, now what happens, in answer more fully to your question, as the show develops and as they keep pushing the limits, and ultimately what Ray Richardson and the crew of Say Brother uh, want to do is really give voice to the black community. And by about the 10th episode, this becomes clear when they do a, a situation on a, a student who had been suspended from one of the uh, high schools in Boston, and they had a lot of black students on and speaking, you know, first person on their experiences and their concerns and the issues that matter to them. And that really resonated both with the uh, audience and with the staff, and they continually moved in that direction of making public TV really TV that voices the sentiments of the public, particularly the black community in the case of Say Brother, which is what they were targeting. Now, after a certain point, that got to be a bit too much, particularly after 1970. In the summer of 1970, New Bedford, Massachusetts erupts in rebellion after some incidents. And New Bedford, for people not familiar with it, has a very significant black population, also a Cape Verdean population. And that is one of the places where, again, if people are familiar with the history, Frederick Douglass goes when he comes north. It's got a, a, a rich history. And when it erupts, Ray Richardson and the Say Brother crew go into the community for six days with their cameras and their van and their filming and interviewing and this is real raw expression coming from the community about all the conditions that people are facing and how they're impacting. I mean, this is the period of the very heightened civil rights black power movement and the war in Vietnam. So in the course of some of those discussions, some four, I don't even know if they're four letter words, but words that were not favorably viewed by the powers that be came out. And Richardson and the Say Brother crew decided that they were going to run this because this was a true expression of how people felt. And that was one of the things that was used as an excuse for um, the action that was ultimately taken to take Say Brother off the air and fire Ray Richardson. There's some little snippets of that in the WGBH vault, which is available online. You co-authored an article with Charles Richardson, the brother of Ray Richardson, entitled The Radicalization of Ray Richardson, Suspicion still surrounds death of black activist TV producer. Did you approach Mr. Richardson, or did he track you down with an offer to collaborate on the special feature? Well, we, we've known each other quite some time. Uh, I, I first met the family back in the 1980s. I've been working over 30 years on Hubert Harrison, and I knew both Charles and his mother. I know his children, his grandchildren. And he goes around and speaks with me sometimes when we go speak on Hubert Harrison. I'm focusing, you know, totally on writing this Harrison and, and Theodore W. Allen, Ray Richardson, these type things. He's on the West Coast, and he's, you know, wonderfully articulate, understands all this. Charles still is, is working, you know, uh, to make a living. The way this article came about, it started... I had read uh, several things on um, the death of Malcolm Shabazz, Malcolm X's grandson. And for me, of course, right away, it brought to mind what I had heard from Ray and Charles's mom, Ada, and from Charles about Ray's death under very su suspicious circumstances. So I finally started drafting a little piece just to comment on that with the lead in being that Malcolm X's grandson wasn't the only uh, grandson of a very famous Harlem activist who was killed in Mexico under suspicious circumstances. And I, as, when I had a little bit of it done, I sent it to Charles. Now, Charles, you have to understand, 
again, his mom's influence in part, but he writes far better than I do. <laughs> he, he, you know, he's good. And he just, and as, as a writer, you appreciate when you can send something and get serious feedback. And Charles just gave me a whole bunch. And I said, Charles, maybe we should co-author this. He goes, ah, Jeff, let's wait, let's wait. And we went back and forth where I'd send him new drafts and he'd, you know, fix them up a little bit, you know, offer some very positive comments. And finally, at the end, he acquiesced <laughs> because he had done mm-hmm. so much anyway. But it was, so it was a collaborative effort. And when I do my stuff, I like to go over it many, many times. So it worked very well. And Charles, as I said, has, has wonderful writing skills and, and analytical, you know, skills. Can you provide an overview of the article and the crucial points you and Mr. Richardson present? Well, the article by Charles Richardson and I begins with a brief introduction drawing some parallels between the death of two outstanding Harlem radicals, Malcolm X and Hubert Harrison. And we use that as a, an opening to tell the story of Ray Richardson and the important work he did and the, uh, the circumstances surrounding his death. So Ray Richardson, we then go through Ray Richardson's family background on his father's side and his mother's side, on his mother's side being a descendant of uh, Hubert Harrison and a very talented mom who's a school teacher and principal, on his father's side, uh, Tuskegee Airmen, and and both parents active in the black theater in the early years, and his father living down in Mexico uh, in later life. Uh, Then we go through... Ray's a little more biographical on Ray talking about his schooling and how he winds up going to college in the 60s, which, again, was quite an achievement, uh, and going to Boston University where he's majoring in film. And he gets some training for this at Horace Mann School in New York where he went on a full scholarship. And he apparently an extraordinarily skilled filmmaker. And he's in the program and he graduates. He does his undergraduate work there and stays on for a master's degree in film. And... He's working in a cooperative program at WGBH when Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated on April 4th, 1968. Public broadcasting station decides it wants to make a little more commitment because it hasn't much at all to the African-American community, and they try and bring on some staff. And within a very short period, Ray Richardson, at age 22, 23, is the producer of a primetime, hour-long TV show in Boston called Say Brother. The closest equivalent that for those of a, uh, in the New York area would be Gil Nobles Like, like it, it Is, is. Mm-hmm. which starts a little bit later. So even, you know, Richardson's even precocious and the staff up there are very precocious because WGBH is really the flagship station for uh, public broadcasting. So they start that show and raise a uh, fiancé, Vashti Lowndes, wins an Emmy in 1968 for her work related to Gil Noble's Like It Is show. So these are extraordinarily talented young people. So in the article, Charles and I go through the first year and how it starts out, and they're trying to feel their way a little bit because this is totally untraveled ground as far as black show. It's an hour-long show, and it gets repeated on the weekend. They bring on some wonderful entertainment. Some of the film clips that we link to in our article Muhammad Ali, speaking on the war, is a profound critique of the Vietnamese war, particularly from the perspective of a black man. Why why should I go fight there? And I I recommend it to people. They're bringing on entertainment. They've got uh, poets. They've got high school students. They've got Amiri Barak. They're bringing students and working people from the community. And they're off into the arts and dance and poetry. And Ruby D is on. And, you know, it's just an extraordinary mix that they're bringing on these shows every week. Every week they're bringing this. And it has tremendous impact. And some of the people early, again, people may be familiar with some of the names, but maybe a younger audience isn't. But also working with Ray on this is Stan Lathan who later does Sesame Street and Red Fox Show and Hill Street Blues, and Henry Hampton, who produces Eye on the Prize, that whole 14-part series. I mean, these are extraordinary people that are working there, and they're young. And Stan Lathan says, yeah, he's got all this experience. He Later, in an interview in 1973, says, but the foundation of what I learned was back that year with Ray Richardson at WGBH, 
And towards the end, I get into some of the tributes. But throughout it, I intersperse comments from the people he worked with, the respect they had for him, his, his style of work. It wasn't arrogant. It wasn't authoritarian. Very collective. And, again, always encouraging and bringing out the best in others. So they do the show, and it continues to have tremendous impact. And on the WGBH vault, which is online, people can get a glimpse of it. Little snippets from some of the shows and some of the descriptions. There's also a wonderful book out by a woman named Devora Heitner. And she's going to be at the uh, Schomburg Center on December 5th in a program hosted by Kamosi Woodard and Jean Theo Harris. And she's going to be talking on the topic of Black Power TV, which is her new book. And in that book, she dedicates one chapter to Say Brother, to Say Brother show. So for people in the New York area, I really recommend that. And it should be a very good session. And she discusses Ray Richardson in some depth. Doesn't get into all that we do in the article about more of his personal background and you know, more, more of a focus on him, which is what we wanted to bring in this article. Um, the show continues to develop and as artists and as producers and as TV people, they're getting a better a conceptualization of what they want to do and really how they want to, they want it to be a voice of the black community. They want to bring information that is of interest, but they want the black community to feel it's their show entirely. And Ray Richardson says, this is who we're aiming at. If we have white listenership, fine, but that's not who we're aiming at. That's not who we're trying to have this conversation with. And it's just remarkably successful and it becomes, uh, I, I think, and I, you know, we, we say this, Charles and I get at this in the article, it becomes threatening to the powers that be, to the white dominated media and the, the powers that they represent. I mean, the financial interests that they represent, because this is a voice from the underside, if you will, and from outside. And some problems begin to emerge. There'll be statements made that the U.S. government or the FBI was involved in the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And that's considered by the station unfounded. And the station makes statements. Well, if you're going to make statements like that, you have to have the other side's view. And Ray Richardson responds, the other side's view, the other side has a thousand hours a week. We get one hour. We should be able to put, we're the other side. We should be able to get the view out. And we describe that a little bit. In the article, we go through the comments. A lot of the people, Jewel Gomez, Jewel Gomez, I spoke with recently, and she's out in San Francisco. And, and a lot of these people maintain their activism in the whole uh, marriage equality struggle. She, she was very prominent in the recent California marriage equality struggle. Other people, Hazel Bright activist and educator in Roxbury and Cambridge, as I mentioned, Sarah Ann Shaw. Uh, Kay Bourne is another uh, person who would submit material for the show. And I recently, I went up to Boston to speak on Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen's work. And the response was wonderful, particularly when we took it to the library um, in, in Roxbury, right? And uh, we had a lot of community activists and leaders uh, uh, attend. And uh, they, of course, they remembered Ray Richardson and say brother from the early, early days. And then we get into what happens when the show decides to go film in New Bedford. When the unemployment rate in the state of Massachusetts was running around 8%, the black unemployment rate was 35%. So staggering unemployment, very difficult conditions. And one incident of a police arrest for a disorderly conduct or something leads to a whole eruption in the community in which the community vents many other gripes and complaints. This is, again, the period of high unemployment, war, pe people being forced to go, you know, fight in wars. Many, many don't believe in and other issues, all the issues around education and health care, schooling. So when those shows air, it is too much for the powers that be at public broadcasting and the interests they represent. And they take the show off very summarily. They take the show off the air and they fire Ray Richardson. Now, the show was much loved in the Boston black community, so there's tremendous protest, and there's United Front Group activities, and many of the people who are going to be active in Boston for the next 30 and 40 years, leading activists, the one who comes immediately to mind, and we've mentioned is Mel King, and so well respected, but there are many others, and there's community protest, and they force the station to bring back the show, and actually the station manager gets fired three months later. 
public broadcasting tries to separate it in this in time a little bit so it's not so obvious that it's from all the pressure from the community that is the reason he's fired but ray richardson is not brought back and the station is adamant that they will not bring him back i think he's really considered a threat because he's very principled in what he's doing and they've tried to talk him into you know toning it down and doing this and he refuses so while he is fired he and his fiance vashti lounge go down to Mexico to visit his father, who's living in Mexico, and who had just lost his father. That's Ray's grandfather. And they go down in December, and they're ready to return in January when the father suggests they go and why don't they spend the last week in Acapulco, you know, take it easy. And as they're getting ready to leave Acapulco in January of 1971, uh, Ray and Vashti, along with two people they met, who Ray's father, Virgil Richardson, was very suspicious of. These people just appeared in Mexico, young people, African-American couple from Buffalo, who, amongst other things, said they were working for the U.S. government. In the article, we get into the little bit that is known about them, how not much still is known about them, where, where, what became them. The one fellow who survives winds up reportedly, at, at least at one point, in Walter Reed Hospital down in the D.C. area. But to make the story short... Ray, Vashti, and the other couple go to Acapulco. They go in the water, and Ray, who's an, a very strong swimmer by all accounts, reportedly dies from swimming, from asphyxiation, as does Vashti, and as does the wife of the other person, uh, the people who come from Buffalo who are reportedly working for the government, although her body is never found. It's just reported that she's dead. They all are reported to drown. Yeah, Ray's body comes in. His father sees his body. And Vashti's body does appear after a period of time, but her family is advised not to come. There's no point in coming, you know. And they, they're from the Washington, D.C. area. She had gone to Howard University for a while. And under the instructions they get from the government, they don't go down. You know, they said there's nothing could be done or anything like that. They, at first, they couldn't even find her body, they said. Again, in the article, we go into it. There's four or five different accounts. None of them seem to work together, raising more suspicion on what actually happened. So I've spoken with a few people. I spoke with uh, Sarian Shaw, and I spoke with uh, Janice Graham, who does a blog talk radio show. And I spoke with the family of Vashti Lounge. I spoke with Miri Baraka briefly when I saw him in Newark, because he knew Vashti very well. And the people I spoke with in general had great suspicion surrounding the death back then, but they weren't quite sure what could be done about it. Now, let me give a little more background. This is a period when... Martin and Malcolm get killed, when Mark Clark and Fred Hampton, Black Panthers in Chicago get killed, when Whitney Young goes to Nigeria and dies mysteriously in a swimming incident, and George Jackson shortly thereafter, you know, is killed. So there's, you know, a conscious effort to remove significant black leaders or young black leaders with potential also. If you and Mr. Richardson are convinced that Ray Richardson and his companion were murdered in Mexico, what would you cite as irrefutable proof that the case should be reopened? And I'm raising this question because I'm sure there are those who are going to be listening to this interview and they'll say, oh, he's just spouting a bunch of conspiracy theories. So I'd like to know, is there something definitive that you could point to that would be justification for law enforcement taking a closer look at this case? The family, Mrs. Richardson, before she passed away, was very clear, and Charles, Ray's brother, is very clear. He points out how the family's phones, because of Ray, right? He, he, Ray's in Boston, and Charles and his mom are down in New York here, but their phones are tapped. Ray's was tapped. They would get, they'd get phone calls and clickings on the lines. Even this is back then. We know what capabilities they have now. We're increasingly learning the capabilities that the, the state has now. But there was much of that going on. And this is a period of COINTELPRO and organized FBI and government policies against the African-American community. As a matter of fact, I only started getting into it. And what I'm really hoping is others will be able to take this little bit that Charles and I put forth and probe more deeply because Charles is also talking about how Ray had mentioned to him in the basement of the White House from Johnson and then into Nixon. They had a room that was monitoring these public broadcasts and monitoring the TV for the black community back then. And this is one more thing that really prompted me to start the article. 
as I started looking at the obituaries and what I could find on Ray's death, when I'm looking at the Boston Globe, which is the main paper in Boston, on the day that the obituary appears regarding Ray and Vashti, right underneath it is an obituary for Jacobo R. Benz. Now, people may not immediately be familiar with that name, but Jacobo R. Benz was the president of Guatemala, duly elected and left-leaning and very progressive. And he is ousted in 1954 in an open CIA coup, right? They engineered the coup. I've got the name, you know, I've got links to more information on all this. I mean, this is all very well documented. They were actually claiming credit for it, you know, for a period there. And he also dies in Mexico virtually the same day because there's some discrepancy whether Ray dies on the 23rd or the 24th, you know, all these different accounts. But virtually the same day, our Benz dies in Mexico also from drowning. And that that really struck me when I saw that, these two people drowning in Mexico virtually at the same time. And then I looked further, and while Ray drowns in Acapulco, our Benz reportedly drowns in his own bathtub in Mexico City. I found that a bit hard to believe. And uh, as we're speaking, I, I just have next to me a book I'm planning to read right now, which uh, I had seen recommended by a friend. It's entitled Our Man in Mexico, Winston Scott and the Hidden History of the CIA. And he's one of the key CIA operatives in Mexico in that period. What I plan to do, and I hope others will do, is to really use some of these Freedom of Information Act requests to probe far more deeply into the circumstances surrounding the death of Ray and Bashdai. And one of the things, you know, we wanted to try and do is make sure that Ray and the very important work he, he and his contemporaries did, he's working with wonderful people, that they did doesn't get lost. And that, that's what we hope. Now, the other thing is, I just want to mention, because I, I think this is important, too. The issues raised in the struggle with Say Brother and public broadcasting really are some very deep issues about what is the nature of public broadcasting. Who is the public? Does that include the African-American community in total? Does it include the people, if you will? Or is it the financial interests that control and influence and get solicitations and funding for public broadcasting? Is that public broadcasting? Uh, another very deep question is the role and freedom of the producers and artists to put forth their product. Or just can these station managers above them just censor things and take them off the air if they don't like the content? Because not only was Ray fired, but shortly after, and this is so often the case, that there'll be an attack on the black community, and particularly if the European American community is silent, which is too often, unfortunately, the case, that it'll come back and bite them later on, too. So shortly after Ray gets fired, a fellow named Fowser, Dan Fowser, who's a, a supposedly a wonderful producer for the Nader Report, which was a progressive show on public broadcasting, and it was their, their main show, he's also fired. And it was over conflicts with the people above him over what he thought should be aired and, and they wouldn't air it. So there's a, a number of very important issues for us still today, I think. One other theme we didn't go into greatly, but Charles was very keen on this. And we, we just wanted to, you know, do an opening salvo at this point. But he talks in 1970, Ray goes out to a conference on a Johnson family estate. Sometimes these big, wealthy financial estates and institutions get involved and set the stage for meetings serving interests of the powers that be. And Ray goes there, and he and Tony Brown are elected the top two officers for a black media grouping that's formed and Charles says that Ray talked with him about that afterwards and Ray couldn't believe because Ray's still young right and he's still learning and he says the feeling he had when he got there was that this was all being orchestrated by very powerful white forces that there were informers and, and agents following people around and things like that so it's a much more probing and damning critique I think of the role of government towards black media. So there's that. And then there's another thing which I found of interest, which is that the two people who are um, above Ray Richardson at WGBH both have significant later ties with something called the Aspen Institute, which is out in Colorado. 
and we put a link in the article to the Aspen Institute, but it's, you know, nominally a big think tank and a place where people can go and hold sessions, but it really has served very right-wing interests for many years. Uh, the issue I threw up had a lot from the work of Michelle Ree, who you may see on Fox News a lot, and she's one of these people attacking public education. Uh, but there was much of that element around, and I've read some history of the Aspen Institute that alleges that it really grew out of MI6, which is military intelligence, British military intelligence, which has always had a role in the U.S. I mention that only because that that's part of the background of the Aspen Institute, but also going back now to Hubert Harrison, Ray's grandfather, Hubert Harrison was one of the very first black radicals monitored by the Bureau of Investigation. That's before the FBI has formed. It's called the Bureau of Investigation and by MI6 who were investigating and monitoring radicals in the U.S. So there's, you know, a lot of connection. There's, there's a lot there. There's much good, you know, that can come out of learning a little more about Ray Richardson and his contemporaries. And I think we'll maybe learn a lot more. Charles always felt that Ray and many of us still today are naive, this is Charles Ray's brother, naive about how concentrated the effort has been by the government to monitor and control uh, black media. Interesting that you say that, because on the other side of that, there are those who might say it's not a matter of being naive, but it's a matter of being fearful. People know that they can be taken out as well. Doesn't that play into all of this? Uh, yeah. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, again, when when I spoke, and this was briefly, and I don't want to, you know, blow up these conversations. I was at a demonstration in Newark when I saw Baraka. So I just, you know, st- st- you know, off to the side and stuff. But his immediate reaction was, well, you know, we were losing many black leaders in that day. So, of course, we were suspicious, right? And I think that's the fear and the consciousness. And that's why Malcolm sits with his back to the wall. I mean, you know, it's fear is justified. And, you know, again, I I think it could be argued it still continues to go on. So we have to uh, just plow forward. But this is wonderful what you're doing. I mean, to get this stuff out on the Internet where others can have access and we can just fight through and share and get this information out. Uh, One of the projects that I'm working on, and forgive me for putting this plug in, but there's no money involved, I can assure you, is... um, At Columbia University, I'm working on a project right now to put all 700 writings of Ray's grandfather, Hubert Harrison, the father of Harlem radicalism, on the web for free, permanent searchable database worldwide. So you can get them in New York, you can get them down south, you can get them in the Caribbean, get them in Africa, wherever. And he's a brilliant writer and activist and... You know, I, I think we can use the new me- we can use the new media also, right? And uh, I, I think that's what you're doing, which is wonderful. Will you or Charles Richardson campaign to have the case reopened? Well, I think that may happen, and maybe with a little prodding that will happen. I think Charles is very interested in that, but uh, again, he's still occupied with work. And in my situation, is I have to finish volume two of Harrison's biography and. You know, I want to get these writings up while, you know, while I'm still healthy and functioning. And so they're, they are like what I'm really working on. I've been meaning for the last couple of months to get off very detailed Freedom of Information Act requests, but I've not done it yet. But others could do this stuff also. But I think we will continue to plow ahead. I think Charles would certainly be open to that, Charles and the family. I mean, as I've indicated, he and his mom are fairly convinced, you know, uh, they've been all along. They didn't, never expressed one bit of doubt to me that there was some foul play regarding Ray's death. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show, Dr. Perry. Thank you for sharing your insights and time. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. That's going to do it for this edition of the G-Man Interviews. Until next time, stay cool. Stay safe and stay informed.